Many hundreds of years ago, a small group of perhaps lost wanderers arrived on these shores and had to build their lives under the most unusual conditions of isolation. Ordinarily, we associate civilizations with large populations who lived at the crossroads of the world where ideas were easy to swap. Conversely, we associate cultural simplicity with people who lived at the ends of the world where they had to depend much more strongly on their own ideas. If we were to attempt to apply this very simple canon of history to Easter Island, we would expect to find the simplest of cultures. Oddly enough, this is not what we find at all. We find a group of people who appear to have been approaching civilization, a group of people with an evolved architecture productive of over 300 large religious structures, a group of people with a spectacular sculptural art productive of over a thousand gigantic statues, and along with these, the engineering ideas necessary to move the massive stones to carry out these things. A group of people who had a written language, which remains undeciphered, but nevertheless is not known to be related to any other script. A group of people who had a political theocracy, an organized priesthood, and a stratified population a group of people who knew a good deal about solar movements and who were capable of marking precisely the positions of the solstice and the equinox. All these things we'd ordinarily expect to find associated with civilization, and by no means among a group of people who lived in the extreme isolation that formerly characterized Easter Island. Dr. William Malloy speaks with authority. He's a professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming, and first visited Easter Island in 1956 with the Thor Heyerdahl expedition. He's been back more than a dozen times, searching for clues to this island, which is further from anywhere than anywhere. Located about halfway between Chile and Tahiti, this 46 square mile speck is surrounded by a million square miles of uninhabited ocean. The nearest populated island is Pitcairn, more than 1,400 miles to the west. South America is 2,300 miles to the east. This eerie, serene, desolate island is the loneliest spot on Earth. The origin of Easter Island's spectacular society is shrouded in mystery. Who were these people? Where did they come from? Why did they suddenly one day lay down their tools and abandon their great sculptural art? Today's island population offers a few clues. They call their island Rapa Nui, which means big flat stone. History on Rapa Nui isn't written in books. It's passed down through legend and song, such as the song of Hotamatua, the island's legendary founder and culture hero. Every child can recite how Hotamatua arrived in his long canoes, laden with vegetables, chickens, and a special breed of edible rat. The song says that Hotamatua came from Hiva, but anthropologists don't agree as to where Hiva was. Some think it must have been the Marquesas Islands, 2,000 miles to the northwest. Several of the islands have the word Hiva as part of their name. Others believe Hiva was South America. The modern-day explorer Thor Heyerdahl finds similarities between the Andean Indian culture of Peru and that of Easter Island. But most anthropologists believe the first Easter Islanders were Polynesians, who originally dwelled on the southeast coast of Asia. 
Centuries later, a migration from South America augmented the population. But the first and strongest influence sailed from the West. Whether from East or West, what they did here was extraordinary. With neither metal tools nor knowledge of the wheel, they hewed colossal stone giants. Surveying a windswept, rock-strewn landscape, these stone giants attested to the genius of this so-called Stone Age people. All but one of the statues standing on platforms today were raised by Dr. Malloy and a team of islanders. His theory is that dozens of small tribes competed with one another to build bigger and better statues, called muai, to adorn precision-built stone platforms used as religious altars. But there is seldom consensus about Easter Island. Other scientists insist the platforms, called ahus, were used as mausoleums, and the moais carved to adorn them. Whether adorning altars for the living or mausoleums for the departed, these brooding, haughty giants stood as magnificent sentinels. All the statues were carved out of a volcano called Rano Raraco, sometimes referred to as the Statue Factory. The side of the mountain is like a surrealistic dream. Hundreds of them rest in every stage of completion. Some weigh eight tons, others more than 80. A few are only 10 feet high, but many are three times as tall. How did they move such mammoth creatures? Dr. Malloy's theory is that when finished high on the mountain, the narrow keel attaching the statue was chipped away. Using hibiscus rope, it was lowered down a prepared runway where it landed in an upright position. Using models, Dr. Malloy experimented with moving the statues. He believes the workers lashed the moai to a specially fitted sled made from a massive tree fort. Another cable, also of hibiscus fiber, was attached from the statue's neck to the junction of a large bipod. Next, it was pulled forward by another cable. The bipod was then repositioned for the next forward thrust. According to legend, the moai walked by magic, and this movement did resemble walking. At the ahu, the moai was turned around and placed a bit higher than the pedestal for the fitting of the top knot, the greatest engineering feat of all. It was attached and held in place by two sturdy beams. Both beams and top knot were strapped with rope. Using wooden beams as levers, the entire structure was raised a little each day. The engineers then built up a mound of stones under the statue until it stood erect. It was a spectacular accomplishment. Unfortunately, the carving of statues superseded the reasons for carving them. The giants became an obsession, and each new moai was a nail in the coffin of Easter Island's expiring culture. As time passed, these activities continued in intensity. And the activities of more and more people were devoted to the art and the architecture, and fewer people to the basic activities of fishing and agriculture that produced food. The society was able to resist this kind of disequilibrium for a considerable period of time. 
but eventually, in a finite environment, overpopulation overtook the people, and the society was destroyed in a chaotic internal warfare. The various tribal groups began to destroy each other. The great statues were thrown down, and the spectacular architecture was torn apart. What had formerly been an occasional ritual cannibalism now came to be a practical food-getting activity. Eventually, there remained only a small, demoralized remnant of what had once been a spectacular society. All this provides an excellent example of what happens to a society when one aspect of its activities are emphasized and other necessary ones are neglected. Until now, most anthropologists theorized that this seven by 15 mile island could never have supported more than four or 5,000 people. There is a strong possibility, however, that the population was in excess of 20,000, a plausible reason for the bitter tribal wars which all but totally obliterated the culture. Island legend has it that all the problems started at a place called Pueke. There were two protagonists a small tribe called Hanau Eete, and a much larger one called the Hanau Mamoko, interpreted by many Easter Island scholars to mean long ears and short ears. The larger Hanau Mamoko tribe was virtually enslaved. After many years, they revolted. Their oppressors, outnumbered and frightened, barricaded themselves on Pueke Hill Point. They dug a defense ditch from sea to sea, filling it with firewood for protection. Their battle plan was betrayed. They were caught from behind by their enemies and incinerated in their own ditch. Only one Hanau Eepe is reputed to have escaped. Many scientists now doubt the long ear, short ears translation. Anthropologists now conclude that Hanau Eepe, rather than long ears, translates as husky, broad, or heavy set people. Similarly, Hanau Mamoko means slight or slender people. Whether because of overpopulation or a revolt, internal warfare racked the island and cataclysmic wars put an end forever to Easter Island's golden age. Every tribe in the island was involved. The air was filled with the crash of falling statues. Each group's moais supposedly gave them power over their enemies. Consequently, each tribe went out to destroy whatever power their adversaries possessed. Not a moai on an ahu was left standing. It was as if the people were burning their libraries, scourging themselves of all past accomplishments. Cannibalism was rampant. The population took to living in caves, emerging only for human food, slaughter and revenge. The Dutch explorer Rogevin discovered and named the island on Easter Sunday, 1722 though the captain wasn't aware of it. What he'd found was a society in its death throes. The islanders nearly consumed their own society, but their visitors during the next century and a half finished the job. Rapa Nui welcomed the ships at first, but violence and death accompanied too many landing parties. The ship's artists sketched serene drawings, but often their practices weren't. In 1808, an American whaling ship carried off 22 islanders after a bloody battle. Finally, allowed out of a ship's hold three days out to sea, all 22 jumped overboard, swimming desperately for home. Legend has it that one actually made it. The year of total tragedy was 1862. A flotilla of Peruvian slave ships reenacted all the horrors of slave raids in black Africa. A thousand islanders were captured and forced to work in the guano fields on coastal islands off Peru, digging bird manure for fertilizer. After a few months, only a hundred remained alive. International pressure forced the Peruvians to return the survivors, but only 15 withstood the return journey, and they carried smallpox. Within months, an epidemic was raging. A glorious population, which once numbered in the thousands, had fallen to a few hundred frightened, demoralized, half-dead remnants. With the dead went all first-hand knowledge of a singular Easter Island achievement, the Kohau Rongo Rongo tablets. No other Polynesian island possessed writing. Because of the island's rigorously stratified society, only those on top, such as the Ariki, held the secrets of Rongo Rongo, 
and they were all killed in the slave raids. The world's museums have the only 26 Rongo Rongo tablets remaining, yet the script is still undeciphered. The wooden slabs are 10 to 15 inches long and 5 to 7 inches wide. What is known is that this system of writing is called reverse bustrafidon. The glyphs are read upright in a straight line. When the end of the line is reached, the reader turns the tablet upside down and reads the next line in a reverse direction. For years, linguists in several countries have attempted to decipher the script, but to no avail. There are some fantastic speculations. The Hungarian scholar de Havasi found that dozens of the Easter Island glyphs resemble the ancient, undeciphered hieroglyphs of the Hindus Valley civilization, extinct for 4,000 years. To another scientist, von Heinegelden, the most ancient of the Chinese picture writing resembles both the Hindu's Valley and the Easter Island script. None of these theories really offer the key to Rongo Rongo. French archaeologist Alfred Metro says that the similarities are nothing more than coincidence often occurring in totally unrelated cultures. The world may never know the real secret to this most spectacular aspect of Easter Island civilization. In the days of Rongo Rongo, Rapa Nui's people loved pomp and ceremony. One of their favorites was the bird cult ritual. This is Arongo, Easter Island's famous ceremonial village. It lies on the knife-like crest of the volcano of Ranukau. This village was associated with the ceremonies of Easter Island's well-known bird cult, the cult of the sooty tern. Here in this village of special construction, long, narrow, subterranean houses, unlike any other on the island, there assembled each year the Matatoa, the tribal war leaders, who had assumed power after the time of the Ariki, the old religious leader. Each of these Matatoa had brought with him a specially trained athlete. And at the appointed time, these were sent swimming through the shark-infested waters to the little islet of Motunui, which we see here. This islet lies about 1,400 yards off the coast. The athletes remained on the islet for days, sometimes for many days, until one of them was lucky enough to find the first new laid egg of the sooty tern. With this, he returned to Orongo and presented it to his sponsor, who then acquired the title of Birdman of the Year. A special petroglyph, as we see here, showing a man wearing a bird mask was carved in his honor. During the ensuing year, his group obtained many advantages. Among the more important of these was the fact that in the continuous conflicts that followed, his group was expected to win and others were expected to lose. And this appears to have been precisely what happened. Horrible atrocities were committed by the victorious group. And only at the end of the year, with the investiture of a new bird man, were the tables turned. Traditional festivities are mostly history on Rapa Nui. Now, on Sunday mornings, the village of Hangaroa is filled with church-going islanders. By the time Chile annexed the island in 1888, missionaries had firmly entrenched Catholicism. Their job wasn't too difficult. The islanders were clinging to their past with only a thread. Even now, however, through the strains of Te Deum, one feels their Catholicism punctuated with the sounds and rhythms of their own lost past. The late Father Sebastian Ingler is one of the reasons we know as much as we do about Rapa Nui. A missionary priest for the Easter Island Parish, Father Sebastian was a Capuchin monk from Bavaria. During his 35 years here, he became a veritable authority on Easter Island's ethnology, archaeology, and especially linguistics. He published two books on the Rapa Nui language, which somewhat resembles Tahitian. Anything of archaeological interest, he carefully numbered and noted. Over the years, he made an extensive collection of Rapa Nui artifacts, which will become the nucleus of the new Easter Island Museum. Father Sebastian loved Rapa Nui and its people. They, in turn, revered him. Consequently, he possessed a rapport that no outside investigator could match, and he obtained knowledge of the island simply not available to others. During his more than three decades here, he became convinced of the basic Polynesian background of the islanders. 
On Rapa Nui, other than walking, the horse is still everyone's principal means of transportation. In fact, there are more horses on the island than people. Hongaroa, the only village on the island, still has some of the charm of the past. But life is changing, for Easter Island is a people in search of a future. Easter Island has no cash crop suitable for export. Anything grown or made would have its profits eaten up in transportation costs. So artists still carve replicas of bygone days. And fishermen continue bringing home their daily catch. Time, however, often revokes past securities. In the old days, the society was basically communal and much less complicated. No one went without. Everyone had his niche in the society. But things are different now. Farming and fishing don't produce enough income for the island's 1,000 people. Until recently, Easter Island's link with the outside world was a ship, which left Chile with provisions once a year. But in 1967, the Chilean government completed an airstrip for large commercial planes, and Lars Lindblad brought the first large group of tourists. The island hasn't been the same since, and the people are hanging their economic hopes on what many consider a necessary evil, tourism. The twice-monthly flights bring not only tourists, but much-needed modern equipment. Money has been introduced into what was basically a barter economy. But unfortunately, there is still very little to buy. The school in Hungaroa has eight grades, and already the children are feeling the effects of contact with the outside world. Many of their parents are planning to open their homes to tourists. A hotel will soon replace this tourist tent colony, and perhaps more visitors will solve some of the island's nagging economic problems. Related to tourism is the archaeological reconstruction that will be carried on by various anthropologists. But they'll be working against time. Rapa Nui's past must be protected for the tourists and from them. Partially financed by the International Fund for Monuments and the Chilean government, Dr. Malloy spends six months a year here digging into the past. This massive precision cut stone wall, which predates most monuments on the island, strongly resembles the massive South American Indian temples of Peru. The remains of relatively small, exquisitely fashioned boat-shaped houses dot the island. This is the Rapa Nui version of a chicken coop. Chickens were trained to enter the hole at the bottom each night. Petroglyphs are everywhere. The island is tunneled with hundreds of caves where paintings tell the tale of subterranean living.
After the uh, statues had been destroyed, the considerably demoralized population lacked the capacity to uh, restore them to their former positions and to rebuild their ahu, and they began to use it in a very different way. Instead of an altar, it became a burial place. And in and among and under the fallen statues were built tombs. So this area right here at present uh, contains over 20 tombs of various kinds and built at various times. This particular tomb is a fairly typical one. It's a rectangular cyst and contains the uh, remains of three skeletons. In a good many other localities, we find tombs of this kind that uh, are simple burials made among the rocks. But this one is uh, a cyst, and as a result, the bones are in considerably better condition than we usually find them. This is only one of a great many such tombs. After we have made a complete investigation of this area, we will uh, restore the original ramp surface, and uh, we probably will terminate with a structure very similar to the one on my left. Unfortunately, the scientists may never uncover all the secrets which shroud this loneliest of islands. Hopefully, the world will learn from what we know happened here. For this open-aired museum is a hermetically sealed laboratory for the study of civilization. <laughs>